welcome to my channel. Spiritual leadership is important. Spiritual leaders are expected to be godly, to operate on Bible order, and in a manner that is fair and just. And spiritual leaders are never in a position to get lax in our assignments. We're going to talk about it on today's video. Let's go. Justly is the International Sunday School lesson for March 29th. My name is Waynell Henson, and you know me as that Sunday School Girl of that SundaySchoolGirl.com, and I am so honored that you have chosen to study this week's lesson with me. I know that this week has been different for everybody. So many of us are now bound by stay-at-home orders in our cities and our states, and we are experiencing ministry in a different way, having to connect with others in unique and different ways, and I am most aware that our ability to even connect in these social spaces is going to become increasingly important to us. Some of you uh, are here because you're regular TSSG watchers and you're part of the family and there are others of you who have found this channel because things have changed in your local churches and you're not able to gather. I first of all want to say welcome if you're one of those new people. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. This channel is more than 28,000 strong. People who are just like you, we love God, we love His Word, and every single week we are here studying the Sunday school lesson. And it's not just a Sunday school lesson right now. More than ever, people need to feel the love of God and to rehearse his word and to know his promises. It is his word that builds our faith, that gets us through these crazy times like we're experiencing now. So I want to invite you to, first of all, subscribe to this channel. There'll be four ways that you can engage with this video. I want to get you connected, so look down below. You'll see the word subscribe. Click that button. It's going to get you connected to this channel. The second thing to do is to click the picture of the bell. That's the notifications button, and every time there's content uploaded, you're going to get a notification. I'm currently doing at least two videos a week. Uh, the last few weeks, there have been three because there's one for children, but it's just a great way to get those notifications so you don't miss anything when it's uploaded. The third thing I need everybody to do for me, and it will bless me as much as it will bless you if you will just click that thumbs up like button. If you've enjoyed this video, if it's been helpful or just encouraging to hear the word of God, click that button for me. Finally, I would love to hear from you. We're all kind of needing that engagement and interaction right now. So please leave a comment down below. I'd love to just know how you are and what you thought about the video or just to say hello. So again, if this is your first time, I want you to know that we are a great group of believers. And I want you to, everyone share this video. I need everyone to share this video. The word of God is needed. It is needed in all of our social spaces. If you are a pastor or a Christian education leader, a superintendent, a teacher, and you're not able to gather in your traditional spaces, I invite you to consider using this video as a way to bring your classes together. Maybe you can host a watch party on your social media or use some other form of technology, maybe sharing it through your email or even posting it on your social pages. But whatever you do, let's stick together. I am committed to no Sunday school dropouts in this season. In fact, I want Sunday school attendance to go up when we are finally released from this. I just believe big things from God. I believe that God is going to help his people. And when we come out of this, we're going to have running in our feet and be excited to be together. I want to say this before I get into to the lesson. A couple of weeks ago, this COVID-19 conversation that we hear about all day long now, it just seemed kind of like a looming boogeyman concept. And two weeks later, it has been brutal. And it has touched and hit many of us now in very personal ways. I want you to know that I, like so many others, am praying every single day. As hard as this is, the one thing I do not lose is my faith and my belief in God. This has been a very um, challenging feeling season, and I hope that you're having an opportunity to talk about how you feel and to be honest in those spaces. Yes, as believers, we believe God, but we are 
also need to talk about how we're feeling and rehearse that, but rehearse it in the light of God's word. Um, I live in a single household, let me say that. So even in a stay-at-home order, if you're like me and the hashtag a friend of mine is um, talking about with me indicates that we, we don't have people in here with us. I won't give her hashtag out, but the thing is that we don't have that kind of engagement with families, but don't let this time wear you down. Make sure that you have community that you're connecting with every day. Use things like your video, your FaceTime, your phone, and stay connected. Let's not let uh, the weight of the world become the weight on us. Remember that God is on our side. God is on our side, and I believe that he's going to see us through. We have a fantastic lesson this week, which I believe is no accident. I had someone to send a message to me on Facebook last night. I need to go back and address that. The question is, do you think that this week's lesson is a coincidence? And my answer is absolutely not. I do not believe that anything that God does is a coincidence. I believe that God's word is targeted and assigned to meet us right where we need it in that moment that we need it. And this week's lesson certainly does that. So I want to make sure that you've got your... Bibles, your commentaries, your journals, pens, handy dandy notebooks, and look for the TSSG notes. If you look down below, the very first uh, link in the description box is the link to my personal notes. If you're not familiar with those, if you click that link, uh, these are just my notes. People used to ask, do you share those? And now I do. Um, so th they're just mine. If you see a typo in there, you just go, she's not a publisher. They're just my notes. But they will help you as you go along in this video. And I know lots of people who create a binder and just keep their notes going forward. So we're talking about leading justly. Our Bible basis is Malachi chapter 2 verses 1 through 9 and chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. The Bible truth. When challenged by Malachi to repent, the priests defend themselves and defy God. Our memory verse is chapter 2 verse 2 and the lesson aim is that we will evaluate the significance of justice for spiritual leadership, appreciate the value of covenant covenanted reverence of God for leadership, and practice just spiritual leadership. Just before we get into the lesson, I also wanted to share that on Sunday morning, I went live on last Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and there were more than 500 people that joined live for Sunday school class on this Sunday. I will go live again and see if we enjoy that format. It's a way for you to be live and interact. It will be here on YouTube. It's a YouTube live. That's why your notifications are going to be important. And we will be able to engage and have a conversation much like Markup Monday, but we'll be reviewing the lesson. One change is the lesson will be at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. I actually am having a Zoom Sunday school with my own class here in Texas at 9, so I need to bump our TSSG time. Uh, your first ministry is at home, right? And then I'll be able to be with our TSSG family. So if you're not um, with your class and you want that kind of engagement on Sunday, I would love to have you back here. All right, so we are talking more about leadership this week. We talked about corrupt leaders last week, and here we are this week talking again about leaders uh, op operating in a way that is just. There is this expectation, we talked about this last week, an expectation of how godly leaders are to behave, and especially in the space that we find ourselves now, we are truly looking to various types of leaders for how they lead in this season. I actually made a post earlier this week that says, Dear leaders, remember that people are going to remember how you operated in this space. They're watching the things that you post. They're watching the things that you say. They're watching how you walk this out. They're watching your attitude. So how we move as spiritual leaders is very important. This week we're looking in the book of Malachi and it is Malachi and it is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi's name means God's messenger. And what a great name for someone who was a prophet, who was a messenger of God. There is not a lot of information that identifies things about like his background or his family lineage. 
But we do know that he wrote to the people of Judah and he wrote to them after their return from exile. And his message was really to challenge their readiness for the return of the Lord. And he talked about judgment. His message was both a promise and it was a warning. And he was one of three minor prophets who had a burden of the word for the Lord. The other two were Habakkuk, who we, who we studied a couple of weeks ago, and Nahum. And through his ministry, God wanted to restore the purity of worship. His goal was to reform the worship in Judah. So again, his writing is really to help the believer focus on the coming of the Lord. Um, it is a four chapter book, so it's a great read. We are in chapter two to start, but it is certainly worth reading and going all the way back to chapter one just for the positioning. And one thing you're going to see as you read at the very beginning of chapter one, I think it's foundational to know that God loved Judah. He loved his people. And even though they weren't always faithful to him, he loved them. And that was sobering and grounding for me, not only going into the lesson, but even in the space that we find ourselves now, we have got to know that God loves us. He has not changed his mind concerning us. He loves us even when we're going through difficult times. Here was the issue with Judah. They had a tough time believing that God loved them. And you'll see that as you read in chapter one. But here in chapter two, it starts with, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. There is no confusion about the target audience for this message. This is for the priests. And the priests were the spiritual leaders of Israel. They served in the temple. We'll talk a little bit about more, more about them in a second. Um, I always identify an issue statement if I can find one. And the issue here in Malachi is that the leaders have gotten off track. They're not focused on the right things. Not only are they off track, but when leadership is off track, you can just about watch the people are going to be off track too. Why? Because the head leads the body. So if the head is going down the wrong road, the body has likely followed the head. And so when you look at the role of the priest, they were entrusted by God to shepherd his people, to be shepherd leaders for the people. But these leaders had gotten lax. I used the word last week in the lesson. They were negligent in their assignments and their responsibilities. And as a result, there was backsliding happening, happening in the land. And God was holding the priest responsible for the backsliding of the people. Here was my aha, and I just mentioned the first one, that the head follows the body. So failed performance and leadership will ultimately be seen in the people. It will be evident in the people. The next aha is that when God's people go astray, God holds leadership accountable. So leaders bear a high degree of responsibility. And this is actually a warning that he's giving in verse 1. The warning continues. He moves into verse 2 and he says, If you're not going to hear and you're not going to take it to heart to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even curse, send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I've already cursed them because you don't lay it to heart. So there's correction coming. And I'll be asking some questions as we have our class on Sunday about how you think about some of these things and how we kind of applied this idea of correction. And you know what? We have to take correction sometime. And here are these priests through the prophet receiving correction. And the correction is saying that if you don't listen, if you don't hear, if you don't not just hear with your ears, we talked about this last week, but hear with an intent to modify your behavior, hear with an intent to change the nature of what's in your heart. If you're not intending to repent, that's what that means. To repent means to turn from your ways and never return to that thing again. Thank you, Dr. Albert Pass. Not only to listen or hear, but to make up your mind to honor God. Those were the two issues that he had with the priest. So this message is really shaking. And we talked about this, this last week with prophets that their messages weren't always 
popular. They had to speak truth to power. And it is a challenging thing sometimes to stand up to leadership when things are not going right. But this prophet was sent with a message from God. So keep that in mind. He's sent by God. But there are times that we have to stand against things that just are not on track. And here the message is to repent, to get right and glorify God. If they didn't do that, what was going to happen? We had a lesson a few weeks ago about consequences, and there would be consequences if these leaders did not get back on track. God says, I'm going to send curses. I'm going to curse your blessings. I'm going to curse your offspring. I'm going to curse your ministry. Let's look at each one of those. The first is material blessings, quite frankly, is what he's referring to. He would curse the very tangible things that they depended on so much. Oh my goodness, kind of feels familiar. I'm not saying that God has cursed us right now, but right now, a lot of us are having to grapple with what it feels like not to have all of our creature comforts, those things that we're used to having our hands on, those things that we depend on, sometimes the things that we've even taken for granted. But our blessings are in jeopardy when we don't keep God our main focus. The second thing he talks about, is the offspring and the offspring here can refer to uh, future generations but it also according to Deuter deuteronomy 28 and 18 can refer to their crops so the offspring the next generation this wasn't just happening now it wasn't just something that would impact these leaders here but future generations were going to feel the impact of poor leadership and i believe that's a thing now in our ministries Future generations will feel the impact of positive leadership and they will feel the impact of negative leadership. So the future is important. And finally, and this one was so interesting, he says, I'll curse pretty much your ministry. And he talks about the solemn feasts. The solemn feasts were these times of communion with God where sacrifices were made. They were huge kind of festive meals. But in these times, they would make sacrifices of animals. Now, what I see when I read this is that, first of all, I observe that they are having sacrifices. They are having solemn feasts. They are having activities. They're doing things. And yet, once again, and we've seen this before, God is not impressed with their ritual. He's not impressed with their activities. He's not impressed with what they're doing. The fact that they met was not enough to equate to the sacrifice that God was truly looking for. He was looking for true worship. So we have to watch that because just coming together is not what God is looking for. He's not impressed with us just being in church. He's not impressed with us just being in the choir. He's not impressed with us just showing up every single Sunday. He's not impressed with our perfect attendance. He wants true and committed worship. And so in the mind of God, they may as well stop because Everything they were doing, all of their activities had lost their meaning and their meaningfulness because the true sacrifice, the true commitment to God was gone. So what exactly does it mean for him to curse their ministries? It's actually pretty graphic. The King James says that he will take the dung. Other translations call it the waste or the excrement. There's one that calls it the awful. And though it's spelled with an O, it is pronounced awful. But it is awful to think about how this whole thing would actually play out. Now, when animals were brought for sacrifice into the temple, before they would come in, they were slaughtered. And their intestines, with all of that intestinal waste, were pulled from the animal and taken outside to a separate area and burned. Now, I learn a lot through the sensory experiences in Scripture. And so for those of you who eat chitterlings, who clean chitterlings, who love chitterlings, I know they're chitlins, but if you've ever had to handle those to clean them, to prepare them, you know the work that goes in because you have to thoroughly deal with everything that's on the inside of those intestines. And so you can imagine the sight of it. You can imagine the touch of it. You can imagine the smell of it. And that's what God is describing, that whereas these intestines would typically be taken out and disposed of and burned by fire, he's saying, I'm going to take the nasty stuff that's on the inside of waste that is intended to be discarded and I will smear it all over your faces and you will be taken out just like those intestines are taken out you'll be the ones that are taken out what he's saying is you'll be the ones that are discarded I'll get rid of you just like you get rid of that refuse 
he is explaining to them that he is associating them with unclean things. And here was my aha, that God was going to expose them as defiled and unclean. He was going to expose these leaders as defiled and unclean. And I do believe that we are in a season, we are in a space where God is exposing leaders who are defiled and unclean. He is pulling the covers off. So the three curses here are the cursings of their blessings, cursing of the offspring, and cursing of their ministry. Now remember from verse 2, we see a conditional statement being made. He's saying that if you won't get back on track here's what I will do so with conditions the conditions both need to be met but there's also a converse of that it is to say that if they would get back on track then he wouldn't bring cursings to these three areas he wouldn't do that but look at the end of verse 2 it says yay I've already cursed your blessings in other words yeah I've already cursed your blessings because you know what I know you and I know you have no intention on getting your heart right I know that you have no intention in repentance and so in verse 4, what is God really looking for? And here, starting at verse 4, we begin to get this picture of what godly leaders look like. I use the hashtag model behavior. And here he says that when this happens, you're going to know. It's not about if it happens, but when this happens, because I know you're not going to line up. I know that I'm going to have to bring judgment when it happens, there's going to be no mistaking that this was sent from God. You know, often we try to figure out, well, what is the source of difficulty or what is the source of something that's come up or something that feels uncomfortable? But here God says, you won't even have to ask any questions. You're going to know it was me that sent this to you. And why? Why would God do this? What was his motive? What was his intent? His intent was to put things back in order the way that things were intended to be i say often that god has always wanted the relationship and the fellowship with his people and he gives model behavior describing the tribe of levi and he talks about them as godly leaders now the tribe of levi comes from the 12 sons of jacob these were the descendants that were chosen and set apart to serve God. They were a faithful tribe. In fact, when Aaron and Moses, uh, back in Exodus with Aaron and Moses, when Moses went up into the mountain and Aaron was left with the people and there was the golden calf that was built, it was the tribe of Levi that did not worship the golden calf. And so when this covenant was made with them, other tribes got land. But the tribe of Levi, because of their faithfulness, they received the reward of serving God. And that's pretty awesome. If you had a choice of land or having the opportunity to serve in the house of the Lord, what would you choose? But they, they have this opportunity to serve God, and they were chosen for ministry in the sanctuary. So we often hear like our liturgical ministry referred to as Levites. We sometimes still hear the priests referred to as the Levitical ministry, but they're chosen to serve in the worship in the sanctuary of the Lord. Verse 5 says, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. So I've already explained to you that they feared the Lord. They showed their reverence for the Lord, for the name of the Lord, that even when everybody else was doing everything that they wanted to do and going after the wrong things, it was Levi that stayed faithful. And so God gave them this covenant of life and peace, and they had this amazing space because of faithfulness. God is rewarding, even in this season, he's rewarding us. Us for our faithfulness he's calling us to faithfulness and they revered the name of the Lord they held his name in high esteem they understood the majesty of the Lord how do I know this what do we see in the tribe of Levi well there are four things that I think I identified here the first is their reverence they were afraid before his name that's the reverence they didn't handle the name of the Lord any kind of way they understood that he was always to be handled in a way that despite displayed the awe that they had for him, to always be impressed with God, to know that he was a God of skill and talent and ability. They had a respect for the things of God. In verse 6, we see three other things. They 
Uh, the truth was in their mouth. The law of truth. What does that mean? It means the law, the instruction, the word of God was in their mouths. They preached the word of God. They didn't preach their opinions. And there are a lot of opinions in the world today. If you want lots of opinions, there is a surge of opinions on the book of faces and in every other social media right now. Everybody knows everything about everything and all the solutions to everything. But here they were weren't caught up in that. They were simply sharing the raw, unadulterated word of God. They preached the truth. And here's the thing about the truth. The truth isn't always what people want to hear because it doesn't always deliver a message of sunshine. It is the raw word of God. And the word of God has purpose. It does come to promote the promises of God in our lives and to share the hope and the joy. But God's word also, when you preach the truth of God's word, it will also bring correction. God's word will show us where we need to be better. It will show us where we're not right. It will show us where we need to improve. And so the truth of the law was in their mouths. The next thing we see is their lifestyles. They walked in the ways of the Lord. They had they were more than just people who went to church. They walked with God in peace and in equity. And again, this was based on the covenant relationship that they had with him. And they were consistent, not with just being in church, but they were consistent in their walk, even outside of the church. They walked in peace and in equity. They had communion with God. And I talk about this a lot because so many of us, are involved in ministry and we're connected to church bodies but God cares about how we live when we leave the church he wants our lifestyles to be a reflection of the communion and the relationship the covenant relationship that we have with him the last thing we see is that they were their witness was powerful they were influencers and all leaders are influencers their lives were teaching as they moved about it was the teaching in the temple but also the ways that they live that transform the lives of others. That's what a witness is. It is when others see the life that you live. They see God's word active in your life. They see you going through times like we're in now and they see what you're saying about it. They're seeing what you talk about. They're seeing how you feel about it. They're seeing your response system and we don't respond to things as the world does. And so people watch our witness and the witness in our lives as believers should be transforming. So they treated others with equity. They were not just, you know, blending in with the crowd, but they stood out as having covenant relationship with God. In verse 7, talks about the priest's lips should be keeping knowledge. They should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord. This is what's supposed to happen. People are supposed to look to spiritual leaders for guidance. They're looking to spiritual leadership for what you will say, for what I will say. And you know what? We have one job to teach the word of God. And when we teach the word of God, I'm just, I'm just a believer that as you teach it, something in you should connect with that word and live it. If we look at the use of our lips, our lips can be used for positive things. Our lips can be used for negative things. But here we see the lips of the priest were used to keep knowledge. And Malachi here is the messenger of God and he reminds them of their roles. He's reminding them that your role as priest, your job is to be messengers. You are messengers for God. The priests represented God. They represented the kingdom to the people. And so they were to take God's word and to make God's word palatable and understandable and livable to teach God's word to the people. And that's our jobs. Our jobs are not to be the best marketed people in the world, to drive the biggest cars in the world, but we are called to teach the word of God, to lift God's word. God's word should be bigger than anything else in our ministries. And most of all, we are to live the word of God. In verses 8 and 9, I group them together. He starts with the word but. And anytime you see but, there's going to be something different on the other side. He's giving kind of this model behavior picture of the Levites. And he says, but you are no tribe of Levi. That's not how you've been out here living. 
And many Christian leaders have corrupted the way. They've corrupted the experience for those that they serve. And that's what these leaders had done. They had corrupted their experience. And here are five failures. There are sins that uh, the prophet lists that he says you are departed. You've changed course from this model of behavior that you have. You've caused many to stumble by lacking fairness. We see injustice here and that's what our quarter is about is injustice they've corrupted the covenant they did not keep God's ways and they've shown partiality and we talked about partiality last week in Malachi 3 and 11 where there were prophets who for pay would tell people what they wanted to hear the more money I got the better your prophecy was. Great message, but if you don't pay me, it would be, you know, damnation and terrible things were going to happen. And so they were partial to people with wealth and resources. And this even included having a better seat in the sanctuary. When you would come into the temple, you'd be able to sit up front while others had to stand in the back. And God had a problem with the way that these leaders had treated people. They weren't just leaders. So we see, therefore, as a result of how these priests have behaved, they're going to receive special judgment. They're going to be in contempt. They are going to be in contempt in the same ways that they had administered the law in ways that were partial. We do skip down to chapter 3. We have printed text of verses 5 and 6. But as you read and kind of connect the dots, and your daily readings helped you to do this, you should have seen that these people were really disappointed. These God's people had seen others, the wicked specifically, prosper while they seemed to struggle. And they kind of concluded, what is this all for? We're here, we're trying to live for you, we're trying to please you. And for them, they saw no correlation with serving God and living a blessed life. And they didn't realize that God had a remedy. And we saw this a few weeks ago with the prophet as well, that we have in our minds the way this should all play out. And if I'm doing my part, it's almost like, well, God, you're supposed to do your part. And that was really their attitude. But God's answer was ultimately that he was going to send a Messiah to judge the earth. But what everybody else was doing had nothing to do with the expectation that God had for his people. And so here God raises charges um, with what they've done. He shows them the issues, their deficiencies. And instead of dealing directly with what God has shown them, they answer God's questions with questions. And if you look through the book of Malachi, that seems to be kind of their pattern. So back in chapter 1, God says, I've loved you. And they say, well, when did you love us? Uh, later on, you know, he, they ask, you know, in what ways do we turn to you? They're always asking God questions instead of dealing with the issues that he's raising. The primary thing that he wants is repentance. But they want God to judge the pagans. They want God to look at everything else instead of being honest and dealing with their own stuff. So God then talks about in verses 1 through 4, there are sins that he's going to purify and then in verses 5 and 6, there are sins that he's going to destroy. And so he makes a promise in verses 5 and 6 of judgment. And it's a final judgment. And it tells us that it's going to come swiftly. And that is affirmed if you look back in verse 1. He says, behold, he will come swiftly. Um, and he's going to specifically judge and destroy these eight sins. Sorcerers, those who practice the occult. Adulterers those who are unfaithful to their marriage vows, false swearers, those who are dishonest in impersonal conversation and when they've sworn an oath like in court, uh, for those who oppress workers in their wages, this is where people are taking advantage of others because of their power, oppressing the widow, oppressing the fatherless, turning aside the stranger, sending people out and not showing them kindness, and lastly, those who don't fear God. And he says in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And there we see the authority of the Lord. He says, I am the Lord, and I don't change. What God wanted, he's always wanted. And they were the ones that needed to make the change. They were the ones who needed to align with what God was expecting. But he's saying, I am the same. And his same meant that I am God. I've always been God. He was the same God who had been faithful to them. He was the same God that they cried out to when they had a need. He says, I'm the one that hasn't changed. And because I haven't changed, if something is different in this relationship and I haven't changed, that means that you are the one 
that has changed. But it was because of God's unchanging nature that Israel had not been destroyed. They had not been wholly consumed. And he's explaining that to them. And he goes on and he's even talked about the relationship. And as you've read your daily readings, and there was even a piece in there that was skipped, but you probably saw where he talks about the relationship even in marriage. And that covenant relationship, he's always viewed his people in terms of that type of covenant, but he's explaining to them that they've been unfaithful, but he is the one who has not changed. So what God is requiring is leaders who are just, leaders who are fair, leaders who will repent, leaders who will seek him with their hearts, leaders who will lead with integrity, leaders who will lead with honesty. There are a ton of key learnings in my TSSG notes. I hope that you've downloaded them. I am going to share, maybe I'll share five. There are probably 10 in here. So I'll give you at least half of these because it's a bunch. First is that spiritual leadership is important. And right now is no time to get lax in what we're doing. We cannot afford to be spiritually lax. There's so much going on right now that we cannot afford to get in places that we don't continue to understand the reverence and the awe of God and to be lax in any kind of way. We can't be lax in our devotion. We can't be lax in our reading of our word. And even though we can't go to traditional worship spaces, we can't even be lax in how we find ways to gather with other believers to be built up in our faith. It is not time to be spiritually lax. We must be prayerful. If we believe God has called us, if you believe that God has called you to any spiritual leadership assignment, be prayerful and start to not just pray, but to practice now living in a way that is just, living in a way that is biblical, living in a way that displays godly leadership. And if you are currently in a spiritual leadership assignment, this lesson calls for us to pull out the mirror. It is time for a leadership check. Check yourself. Check your motive. Check the areas in which you serve. Check the type of leader that you've been. Check the way that you've served other people. We have to remember that leadership is not about being made big, but it is an opportunity to serve. We're serving God's people. A spiritual leader doesn't have to have stellar marketing or PR presence, but they do have to have stellar lifestyles. We do have to watch the ways that we live. God gives us space to confess, repent, and be right with him. And so we have to honor him in that and to walk in his truth. Next, we must repent and give glory to God's name. Failure to do so results in God's blessings being removed from us. It results in God's blessings being removed from us. And there is a constant need for us to repent. We don't always get it right. So we have to continually make sure that we are getting things right and keeping things right with God. We are in constant states of growing and developing as leaders. And so we're going to learn things along our journey that make us better. But we have to always be willing to repent. And we have to give an account for every deed that we do. Next, generally an organization is no stronger than the leader. So um, as you seek out organizations that you'll be a part of, as you seek out ministry to be connected to, always be prayerful. Be prayerful about the leadership that you choose to follow because not every leader is a just leader. And that's why we have lessons like this to help us understand. The last thing I'll share is that the call to ministry is a high standard. And so the way that we walk is a reflection of God and we must follow God constantly. We must follow God consistently. We must follow God faithfully. This is the lesson for this week. I'm sure that you have a lot to share. So leave me notes down below. I'll add your notes to my notes. I'll stop sweating. And when we get to class on Sunday, we'll all have bomb notes. Don't forget, if you want to join me on Sunday morning, I will go live at 10 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. I live in Texas, so 10 a.m. Texas time. I'll be live, and I look forward to sharing with you. I will ask you again, if this lesson has blessed you, first of all, to give it a thumbs up like. And would you please consider sharing a Sunday school offering with our class? We ask each class member to consider a gift of $3. You can share your Sunday school offering by cash app by using the dollar sign that Sunday school girl or 
You can find us on Giblify, or if you want to go to the website and use the PayPal donate button, it is there for you as well. I am so happy that we had our time. Everybody stay safe. Respect the stay-at-home orders. Stay at home. I know it's hard. And don't forget to look out for others in your church, in your community. And let's continue to love each other. You all stay safe. Be well. I'll continue to pray for you. And I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.